I think we're really getting down to the end of it, right? I mean, when it comes to investments. Because my thesis for a long time has been that the U.S. was setting itself up or the Fed was setting up the United States uh, for a major currency crisis. And the currency crisis is the byproduct of years and years of kicking the can down the road with quantitative easing and 0% interest rates. And everything, everything that they have done has been designed to delay the day of reckoning. Nobody wants to solve any of the problems. Now, Donald Trump, as a candidate, in a way sounded like he wanted to do that because he was calling out a lot of the fake statistics and talking about the asset bubbles and saying, hey, elect me and it'll be different. I'm going to fix things. Well, the problem, though, with Trump was he promised pain-free solutions. See, he didn't level with the American public because it's hard to get elected if you're trying to get elected on a message of tough love, right? Hey, we've got to shrink government. We've got to cut Social Security. We've got to cut Medicare. You know, interest rates have got to go up. So stock prices have to go down. Real estate prices have to go down. We've got to fire a bunch of government workers because we can't afford them. You know, it, you can't really say this stuff to get elected. So he, but I was thinking maybe the guy is just being a politician to get elected. And when he becomes president, maybe he'll be a statesman. Maybe he'll do the right thing. Well, it pretty much is obvious that that ain't going to happen. I mean, Donald Trump is acting like, uh, like, a, like a politician and trying to kick the can down the road. The problem is we're running out of road. We are very close to a major breakdown uh, in the bond market, in the dollar. In fact, the dollar, I think, is what's feeding the bond market. Bond prices are down again today. We are, what is that noise? We are, oh, yeah, I'm on the West Coast. <laughs> so we are, um, we are right up against the 200-month moving average in the yields on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. I mean, we're a day or two away from breaking through that. And if we do, we can have a quick move up in the yield on the 10-year to maybe three and a quarter. That would be the highest yield since 2011. And, you know, we've accumulated a lot of debt since 2011. But also, if we break through that, I think we can run right to 4%. And that's about as high as we got before the financial crisis in 2008. And if we couldn't sustain a 4% yield in 2008, how are we going to do it now? I mean, we have so much more debt now than we had then. Remember, I said even yesterday, my main thesis has been that the consequence of what the Fed did to get us out of the financial crisis was going to cause a dollar crisis. The one thing that probably has surprised me is how long it's taken. There's been a very big lag between QE and 0% interest rates and what's about to happen. And I think what really stalled us was the big dollar rally we had in 2014, 2015, when everybody was convinced that what the Fed did worked, right? Alan, uh, Ben Bernanke was a hero. He saved us. He wrote that book, you know, The Courage to Act. I mean, he was on covers of magazines. He was our savior. Everything is going to be great. Everybody started celebrating victory prematurely because no victory had actually been won, right? I always said that the easy part is to do the quantitative easing. The hard part is to end it. And we're about to find out that it's impossible to end that program. Because as interest rates go back up, now you reveal all of the problems that have been papered over uh, during the time period where they were keeping them low and they were monetizing all of the debt. So that, that extra period, that extended period of time, allowed the U.S. economy to get in much worse shape and at, allowed the bubble. See, I thought when I was you know, predicting the financial crisis, I, I thought that the Federal Reserve would try to reflate the bubbles. I didn't know that they would succeed. Uh, but because they succeeded, it's going to be even worse. So getting the, the investments right is more important now because the, 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 the implications are much bigger. And the reason I kind of I title this the, the Trump train wreck is because everybody is on this Trump train. Everybody is so optimistic. About, about the markets, about the economy. I mean, I've never seen anything like it, even among my own clients, even today. I spoke to a woman this morning who's closing her account with me because she's unhappy with the return. She started three years ago. She's up 
She was up 28% over the last two years, but the year before that, and she's got a very conservative strategy with me, just dividend paying foreign stocks. But the year before that, she was down. So over the three years, she'd have done better in the S&P. So she's selling out now to put all her money into the U.S. stock market, right? And, I, and she's actually buying an annuity in her, you know, t fixed to the S&P 500, stupidest thing she can do. She's going to pay a huge commission up front. And she's getting out of a strategy that's really just starting to work, right? I mean, because she, if she only realized she's, you know, she's beating the S&P re more recently. But I'm seeing this all over. People are so excited about the markets. They're just buying into it. These are people who bailed out um, years ago when the market was much lower because they were afraid of Obama. So they got out of the market and now they're excited about Trump. So they're buying back in. It's the same thing they did before with Clinton. A lot of people sat out the boom under Clinton, and then when Bush was elected, they bought into the market right before the bottom dropped out. Right? Individuals are horrible market timers, but more important than the fact that we have a bubble in the stock market is the bigger bubbles in the bond market that is about to pop, the bubble in the dollar, and what that means. Because I think once this starts to move, these moves are going to happen quickly. You know, once we kind of break these trends, once interest rates start to rise, they're really going up. Because if you think about it, I mean, why should interest rates be so low when we have so much debt, right? The more debt you have, the higher the rate should be because you're, you're a worse credit risk. And of course, when you're looking at credit risk, right, what, what are these small little credit, credit rating agencies in China just downgraded U.S. Treasuries to some triple B or to some kind of junk bond status? which is the reality what U.S. Treasuries are. They're junk bonds. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, America is never going to default. Yeah, the bondholders would be luckier to get a default. What they're going to get is inflation. See, when you're trying to measure the credit risk of a government bond, what you're really looking is at the currency risk. Because any government that borrows in its own currency, they could just create it out of thin air. So the question is not whether they're going to default but whether they legitimately can tax their enough to pay off their debt, which we can't do. It's impossible. The average American is broke. He has no money. There's no way the government can get the money out of American citizens to repay the money that the U.S. government has borrowed. The only way to get the money is to create out of thin air. Well, the problem is it's not going to have much value because we are very close to a currency crisis. Because as interest rates start to rise, because of the dollar falling, and because the dollar is falling, consumer prices are going to rise. All this inflation that nobody thought you know, was going to happen. Oh, look, see, we printed all this money and there's no inflation. There was just a big lag between the inflation and the prices going up. So prices are going to start to go up, and you're going to have big increases in consumer prices, big increases in interest rates, and that's going to prick this bubble. But the, the, the scary part is going to be the reaction that the Fed has. Because the Fed is going to react almost routine. Uh-oh, the economy is weakening. Unemployment is picking up. The markets are falling. we got to go back to QE. we got to cut rates, and we got to do more QE. Well, the market is not expecting that. The market has been bracing for more rate hikes and for quantitative tightening. Yet despite all this, the dollar is falling. Uh, gold is rising, commodities are rising, but when, when the Fed has to do an about face, then that's it. The bottom's going to drop out of the dollar because people are going to realize that they've been lied to by the Fed, right? That there is no way out of this policy, which is what I've been saying from the beginning. You can't create an economy that is completely dependent on cheap money and then take the cheap money away and expect everything to be okay. You can't. It's like saying, I'm going to I'm going to you know, become a drug addict, and then one day I'm going to just stop taking drugs, and I'm, I'm going to feel just as good as when I used to take the drugs. You, you, you can't do You're going to go through a withdrawal. And that's what we're going to go through. It's going to be an economic withdrawal, a monetary withdrawal. But I think in order to slow down the rate of increase in interest rates, the Fed's going to go back to quantitative easing. But then as the dollar starts to tank, interest rates are going to start to soar for corporate bonds, municipal bonds, and then the Fed's going to have to buy all those bonds, too. Otherwise, the corporations will start defaulting. The states will start defaulting. Nobody can afford. Look, I I'm living in Puerto Rico now as my main. Puerto Rico is broke, and they stop paying interest on their bonds, right? Everybody knows Puerto Rico is broke. Well, three years ago, four years ago, they were just as broke as they are now. But everybody kept lending the money. They could borrow all the money they want. There were actually some hedge funds 
two years ago that were dumb enough to lend them more money. I mean, I was laughing about it. I was living there. I said, there's no way they're going to pay these bonds. But what ultimately happens is interest rates go up, and then the party is over. That's what happened in, in, uh, uh, in Greece. You know, you have all these countries that all of a sudden they have a, a crisis. Well, why did you know? But they're, they're, they're broke all the time. It's just that eventually the bondholders lose confidence, and then the interest rates go up, and then they can't pay. Well, the same thing is going to happen with the United States. When people holding U.S. Treasuries lose confidence in our ability to repay with money that hasn't lost value, then the party's over. See, then interest rates start to go up. People want to be paid for taking that risk. It is very risky to own U.S. Treasuries. The 2 3% yield doesn't even come close to covering the risk. But if we had to pay an interest rate that was high enough to compensate for that risk, we can't afford it. We'd have to default. So, the, and this is going to happen very quickly. I mean, this is not, you know, this is not going to go on over decades. This is going to happen over the next several years. It's going to happen while Trump is in office. We're going to have this crisis, and it's, and, and it's going to mean that we're going to have a socialist president in 2021 in the United States. But, I mean, and, and that's a whole bit, another, another disaster. But between now and then, you've got to get this trade right, right? And, and, and the trade is to be out of U.S. dollars, out of U.S. stocks, out of U.S. bonds, and, and into the type of investments that do well in an inflationary period, because the world is in for that, not just the United States. Everybody's had interest rates too low for too long. And a lot of that inflation has showed up in certain financial assets, but it is going to move into real goods, consumer goods, commodities, resources. To be invested in, the, in emerging markets, there, there are countries that benefit from a weak dollar because there are countries that suffer from a strong dollar. The emerging economies benefit greatly when the dollar goes down because their purchasing power goes up. And a lot of these economies have U.S. dollar denominated debt. And when the dollar goes down, it's like their debt is being forgiven. All of a sudden, they have more money to spend on other things, to invest domestically. And I believe, too, you look at China. In China, you know, China now, personal spending in China, consumption is the same as the United States. I mean, Chinese consumption is going up. It's going to skyrocket when the dollar declines. I said yesterday, I think the U.S. dollar is going to hit an all-time record low this year against the Chinese yuan. And then it's going to keep falling. Right? You had a lot of hedge funds that were shorting yuan a year ago. Right? That they had the opposite. They should, they should have shorted the dollar. They should have been buying the yuan. But as that goes up, and all of a sudden, the Chinese consumer becomes a lot wealthier than he is now, it's going to change a lot of the global perspective. So you have to have portfolios that are going to profit from a major realignment of wealth and purchasing power. Right, because Americans have been living beyond their means for a long time. Right? We, we don't produce very much in America. We import everything. Right? We have record trade deficits now. They're going to go up. We import everything, and we pay for it by, by exporting IOUs that we can never repay. Right? We just keep going deeper and deeper into that. It's like a global Ponzi scheme. We keep getting real goods and services, and we give people IOUs that they just constantly roll over because they never actually buy anything, and then we don't save. We borrow what everybody else saves. Well, what's going to happen is the dollar is going to tank, and Americans are going to stop spending. And when interest rates rise, of course, Americans can only spend if they can borrow, because everything they buy, they borrow. And, and so when, when interest rates go up, there's no more consumer lending, and the dollar tanks and all the imported products go way up. So Americans stop shopping. Right, which in the long run is a good thing, but in the short run, it's going to be a bad thing when 70% of your economy is based on people spending money they don't have to buy things they can't afford. When that comes to an end, this whole phony thing comes toppling down. But the purchasing power that Americans lose, somebody else gains, right? Because all the goods that are produced, they're not going to stop producing them. The difference is who's going to get them. So you've got to have businesses that are positioned to benefit from the consumers that are going to have more purchasing power in the future and avoid being in businesses whose customers are about to go broke. Or they, they've been broke for a while, but they've been able to buy stuff even though they're broke because they can borrow the money. And so that's going to change. A lot of people are going to lose a lot of money over the next several years as this thing plays out. Right? But people are going to make money as well. It's going to be a gigantic transfer of wealth 
uh, from certain people, other people. So what you want to do is make sure you are positioned to be the beneficiary of that transfer. Or you want to ride that wave. You don't want to get crushed by that wave. You know, I, I look today at all the people who are so excited about the U.S. economy and the U.S. market and everything is great. These are the exact same people who were so excited about the U.S. economy in 2006 and 2007 when George Bush was president. Everything was great. You know, we cut taxes. We have a Republican president. Nothing can go wrong. This is great. And then we, we you know, there was a financial crisis. This dollar crisis is going to make the financial crisis look like a Sunday school picnic. And if they, do the, if they actually did the right thing to prevent the dollar crisis, there's only one way to prevent it, and that's to have a worse financial crisis than the one we had before. Right? So they, there, there's no good way out of this. Every way is a disaster. It's just that one way is worse than the other. And for political per expediency, they may, they're probably going to pick the worst alternative, which is massive inflation, which potentially can turn into hyperinflation. Uh, but you have to be prepared for it. And so what I'm doing, and that's why I, I, I've, turned out, I've turned out these cards, right? I think the returns, now I know a lot of people in the room already probably have gold and gold stocks. So I mean, these things, I mean, the returns are going to be enormous in this sector, right? But the key is to get yourself positioned properly. Now, I have different managed account styles that I have. I manage people's portfolios globally in dividend-paying stocks, foreign stocks, investing in mature markets, Switzerland, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, even here, some up in Canada, but countries around the world trying to get real companies that are not expensive, that pay good dividends. We also do a lot of mining stocks. I've got a gold uh, fund that is managed by Adrian Day, the Euro-Pacific Gold Fund. I have five mutual funds that you can buy. One is an emerging market fund, uh, one is a global value fund, one is a dividend payers fund, and one is a short-term bond fund. So it's really just a currency fund. So I don't buy long-term bonds because I believe the losses there uh, will be substantial as interest rates rise, but it's just kind of a way to get out of, uh, out of the U.S. dollar. So you want to you, you want to have these portfolios of quality foreign stocks. The emerging markets, I think, are just getting started. I think my emerging market fund gained about 35 percent last year, and that was probably I don't know if that, that was probably in the middle of the pack. My gold fund, I think, over the last two years has been number one. I can't claim credit for that one because it's managed by by Adrian. But I think I think we got a great portfolio there in in uh, in that gold fund. But this this is very early. If you go back to the last dollar. Uh, bear market. It was when uh, Trump, when when when, uh, uh, when Bush inherited a bubble from from Clinton, and the dollar bubble popped along with the stock market bubble, and that's when we had oil prices went from 20 to 140, gold went from 300 uh, to a thousand, silver went from four or five bucks to 50 bucks. Remember that? Well, this is the same thing all over again, except it's a bigger bubble. The U.S. economy is in much worse shape now than it was back then. So I think the, all the, everything that happened is going to be repeated only on a bigger scale, except instead of a huge dollar rally at the end, like we had in 2008 when everything reversed, I think that's when we're going to have the move go parabolic. So I think the dollar, so the, this, the dollar went like this from like 2001 to 2008. And then the financial crisis hit and the dollar went like that. Right? And then we started to go back up, and then it had another rally. But I think what's going to happen now is the dollar is going to be falling and falling, and then all of a sudden it's going to go like that, the opposite direction, because it's going to collapse. There's going to be a panic, a rush to get out of the dollar. So that is the ultimate end game. Right? And, and, you know, and I'm going to talk later. There's this crypto debate. I don't believe that these cryptocurrencies are going to be the hedge. In fact, they may crash before the dollar. Right? So I think people who are in the cryptocurrencies also need to get out of their, you know, they need to get out of their cryptocurrencies, just like I think people need to get out of the dollar and get into a real portfolio of real assets that will preserve their wealth. Now, I noticed that, you know, a lot, there are a lot more people out here. So when we leave, I was handing out these cards. So if you don't have one of these cards, let me know and I'll make sure that I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. These cards are to get so I can get you on my, on my newsletter, but also have someone talk with you and, and walk you through our strategies. Now, one company that I will mention in particular uh, that I think is, is, is going is is, is to thrive through this environment is a company by the name of Gold Money. And what Gold Money does, and I sell gold through a company called Shift Gold. I sell physical gold. But what Gold Money does is they enable you to use your gold as money. 
They enable you to effectively put yourself on a gold standard by having an account that you can just go to goldmoney.com and open up your account, and you can buy gold on the internet, and now you own it. It's your gold. The commission is a half a percent over spot. And once you own it, you can give any fraction of your gold to anybody you want for free. You can send it anywhere in the world. You're sending real gold. What's happening is the ownership is changing. And you can pick the vault. You can have a vault in Singapore, a vault in Sw Switzerland, a vault here in Canada. They're all run by BRICS, which has never lost an ounce of gold in their, what, 150-year history. But you can set up an account, and you can transfer gold pretty much instantly around the world for free. Eventually, you know, merchants can start pricing their products in gold. If you have any products that you sell or any services, you can invoice your customers in gold. If they have a gold money account, they can pay you in gold. And of course, if you want to interact with people who don't have gold money accounts, they give you a free MasterCard, which you can use to spend your gold. Right? I, and if you, don't, if you don't want a free one, if you want one that's actually made of gold, if anyone wants to see this, I can show them. This is my card that's made of gold. So there's about $1,500 worth of gold in this card, American. So I can melt it down and it's gold, but that's, that's a MasterCard. And if you have $100,000 worth of gold in your gold money account, you're carrying it around in your wallet with you at all times. And you can spend any part of it that you want. Whenever you can go to an ATM machine and take out cash, you can spend it. But I'm hoping that more and more people over time will just stop opting out of you know, the fiat currencies and own gold. I mean, and one of the things they used to say about Bitcoin was, well, you know, you can't buy a cup of coffee with gold, but you can, you, but you can buy it with Bitcoin. Well, you can't buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin because it would cost you 10 times the, 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 the price of the coffee. But using my gold money account, if my gold money merchant wants gold, I can buy that cup of coffee for a price of gold, and the transaction cost is less than the transaction cost of Visa or MasterCard. And if they don't want my gold, I can still spend my gold by using my MasterCard. So the reality is I can buy coffee with gold. I can't buy it with Bitcoin. And I think more and more people will end up moving to that gold money platform. And by the way, the stock is publicly traded. If you want to take a flyer, I think it's a great punt. I think the company XAU is the symbol of the company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So if you want to actually own part of the business, and they actually are like a cryptocurrency play. So while the crypto bu bubble is going, they do a lot of trading and they provide a, a, a secure way of storing cryptocurrency. So I think it makes money off the crypto bubble, but I think it makes more money when the crypto bubble pops because then I think a lot of people who thought digital gold is better than real gold are going to go back to the real thing. And in fact, gold money takes gold and allows you to use it digitally, right? It actually fulfills on the promise that Bitcoin made, but they can't deliver on.